Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wadawurrung people, uh, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we gather this evening. Uh, we recognise this land uh, and their culture as one of deep learning and designing and creating and celebrating for thousands of years. I pay my respects to the Wadawurrung elders, past, present and emerging and I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Can I welcome you all to this Geelong Design Week event, Young Masters Unpredictable. My name is Emily Fitzsimons. I am the Director of the Centre for Learning, Research and Innovation here at the Geelong College. We are thrilled that you could join us all this evening. Excited uh, that you are here to take part in the Geelong College's first ever Geelong Design Week event. And we're especially excited that it can take place live, uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate, like all Geelong Design Week events, we had to have an online plan in place, uh, but we're thankful that we didn't have to uh, enact it this evening. Um, we hope that uh, many of you have had a chance to wander through the Austin Gray Centre, uh, of which we're very proud. It's been a place of learning and designing for many years now, um, and was the starting point for each of our guest speakers this evening. We have an evening in two parts planned for you. Uh, the first session involves four old collegians, now three, I'll explain why in a moment, uh, giving a seven minute presentation each. And then the second half will be a hosted panel discussion with a further four old collegians and a special guest chair. There will be a short minute of transition between these two sessions as we reset this space here. Our vision this evening is to explore the ways in which designers from different fields tackle the unpredictable in their careers, how design thinking and the work of different designers can both be a vehicle for and in response to our encounters with the unusual, the unexpected or the new. One of the words to describe 2020 was certainly unpredictable, but how do we turn circumstances around and become able, capable, actionable, sustainable in unpredictable times? Indeed, we can, can we even leverage the unexpected for greater outcomes? Questions like these drove us to plan this event this evening, and our first group of presenters are going to tell us how their professional lives include tales of the unpredictable. We asked each of them to tell us about something unpredictable in their journey to date and how they've responded to it. It could be a story of the unforeseen, a single conversation or a moment when everything changed for them professionally. These should be deeply interesting. So our first presenter this evening was to be Ada Hodgson. Ada unfortunately took ill this afternoon and had to ring us at the very last minute um, apologetic uh, that she wasn't able to be here. We are disappointed that she couldn't be here this evening, but hopefully there'll be an event in the future when we can welcome Ada uh, back to college. So our first speaker this evening then is Lachlan Patrick. Let me tell you a little bit about Lockie. Uh, so Lachlan graduated from the Geelong College in 2014 and he is a tech savvy megatronics engineer. He specialises in rapid prototyping, autonomous surface vehicles and humanitarian engineering. Lachlan has worked as an engineer in a number of roles including welding, robotics, ASV research, working with a 3D printing startup company in Beijing, as well as humanitarian engineering work in Vanuatu and India. Lachlan currently works as a STEM program facilitator at the Geelong Tech School, uh, which includes the operation and expansion of the school's manufacturing wing, where he teaches engineering design and design thinking in the new landscape of digital and rapid prototyping. Please welcome Lachlan. That's just that, that yep, one. that one there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, a few. Okay, excellent. That was a fantastic introduction. Thank you very much. I will just go halfway down here. All right, so I work in education, teaching teachers and students how to use engineering tools such as computer-aided design, 3D printing, laser cutting, and computer-controlled milling to prototype and test ideas and designs. There are many unpredictable moments that came to mind when I first saw tonight's prompt. I think one of the major ones that stood out to me was listening to a talk, quite like this one, in which a successful engineer outlined their education and career progression, and it was most certainly not a straight line. 
Quite the opposite, in fact, and I'll just check that I've got this right. Yep, perfect. Okay, so they made the observation that the word career has two meanings. The first being a pursuit or occupation undertaken for a significant portion of one's life, and the latter to move in a swift and uncontrolled motion. <laughs> kind of like this speech, and my own progression. Something I wish to highlight is that when we look back at things, they seem quite clear and straightforward, when in reality, it's anything but. The future is quite unpredictable. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so this was me at about your age. My introduction to design was through blacksmithing and maintaining steam engines. Uh, yes, I was uh, a bit of a, a steam engine nerd. This was my plan. I'm sure a lot of you have plans perhaps a bit like this. It was a good plan. Except it banked on nuclear power becoming politically and economically palatable, which in 2016 it became clear that it most certainly was not. <laughs> yeah, no surprises there. So halfway through my second year of electrical engineering, I suddenly had no plan. I doubled down and decided I wanted to try and study mechanical engineering at the same time and attempt to graduate with both because I wanted to work with electromechanical systems design uh, or robotics. Not a super solid half-baked plan. Thankfully, the head of school for engineering talked me out of this idea and recommended mechatronics, the perfect combination of both. I was also introduced to the head of engineering outreach at the time, not knowing that I would end up working for her then and then a number of years later in a completely different organisation, my unpredictable moment as it were. After that, I attempted to take up any and all opportunities I could find, and part of the reason I'm going through these is that if you're interested in design and technology, let it be known that there are a lot of directions uh, that engineering can take you if that's something that you find interesting. I didn't really have much of a plan, so I thought if I kept trying things, something would click. Here's what I tried. I was awarded a summer research prize designing and constructing a low-cost autonomous surface vehicle, as well as publishing a paper. Interesting but no cigar. Next, I applied for an economic study scholarship to Shanghai. I now know a lot about value adding in global supply chains and far more than I care to know about the Belt and Road Initiative. I tried something like that again, thinking perhaps international work might suit me. I applied for another scholarship for three months working in Beijing with a 3D printer startup company in the Dongshan Innovation District. I learned a lot. I also gleaned that I like working in Australia. Next, I was fortunate enough to land a role in my final year working with a prominent manufacturing engineering firm in Lara, principally with automated quality control machinery and welding robotic systems. It was interesting, but I still felt like there was something missing. What fulfilled me was some of the other things I did along the way. One being in engineering education, which led me to where I am now, Throughout my studies, I was involved with Engineers Without Borders High School Outreach, briefly running the Deakin chapter, and for a number of years, I worked with Deakin Engineering's outreach programs. Through this, I found I enjoyed education. I also did some volunteering work overseas in a humanitarian capacity, assisting World Vision and Field Ready in design and implementation of locally manufactured solutions to aid disaster displaced populations in Vanuatu. Uh, it was MacGyver-esque, and that's when I fell in love with design, and rapid prototyping. The result of all of these seemingly disconnected things is this. I had an odd mix of skills and an old acquaintance who had just been put in charge of a yet to be constructed tech hub to support the Geelong region. I've worked at the Geelong Technology School for about three-ish years now. It's been surreal. We work with 27 high schools in the region, including Geelong College. That shiny new building on La Trobe Terrace is tasked with supporting students and teachers in the Geelong region to give them access to high-level STEM facilitation, advanced manufacturing facilities, and specialised tutorials and professional development so that we can share our skills and experience from a wide range of STEM fields. I'll finish up with this. Engineering, computer-aided design combined with rapid prototyping equipment can be used for all sorts of things. During the early pandemic, when everyone was preparing for the worst, I got a number of requests to put the tech school's equipment to use. 
So I assisted general practitioners and hospitals with prototyping isolation equipment. Thankfully, the worst never came to pass, but the need for design and familiarity with rapid prototyping processes and equipment was quite valuable in that time. And I dare say, for those of you looking to work with design in the future, highly valuable for you too. Thank you. Lachlan, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, our next speaker is Nick Manton. So Nick graduated from the Geelong College in 2016 uh, and he is a graphic designer. He's currently working across a range of media, uh, including illustration, branding and web design. Heavily inspired by music, Nick's interest in design began when he was observing album cover artwork and rock posters. This led to his passion for detailed illustration, which combines type and vector graphics with plenty of gritty texture. At this early stage of his career, Nick is interested in how brands interact with the world in a meaningful and memorable way, and how to reflect that in his work. Please welcome Nick. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. So my name's Nick. I'm a graphic designer. Um, I'm in my second year working full-time in design for a company called Rock Agency in Melbourne. And I've been asked to sort of share my experience so far as someone who's relatively new to the design industry and um, what I've sort of found unpredictable so far. Um, is this thing working? Yeah. yeah, so a lot of the projects I've worked on so far tend to have something to do with music, or be related to music. Um, music's something that's always really personally interested me, and I find it really rewarding to be able to have something to do with it in my job. Um, so I'll just flick through a few of the projects I've done with Rock Agency so far. So, so this is for Cooper's Brewery. So during lockdown, Cooper's launched a live music streaming event. I worked with the team at Rock to design the website for it, so the concept was um, it's created by an ad agency who we share an office space with called the Taboo Group. Um, the idea was to keep the Aussie pub alive during lockdown through a streaming platform. Um, it was really great to be able to produce work that sort of supported the hospitality and music industry at a time where they were particularly challenged. Um, I'll just flick through these. So I designed some merchandise for a punk band called ZZ Death Rays. These guys were one of my favorite bands in high school. Um, it's a really rewarding project. Um, <laughs> so the concept, uh, so this is in 2018 in their Canadian sort of leg of the world tour. It was a really fast turnaround. Um, they just realized they hadn't printed enough t-shirts in Canada, so I had about two or three hours in a hotel room to put something together. Um, this is what I did. <laughs> Uh, small town group, so um, these guys are a really cool kind of pub in Brunswick. Um, they sort of act as a bit of a one-stop shop for music um, and bands. Uh, so artist management service, a pub, a live venue, and a recording studio. Um, this was one of the first projects I got my hands on at Rock, and it's still one of my favorites. Um, so today, I guess I just want to share my experience so far getting into this sort of work. Um, and some of the unpredictable aspects of my journey so far. So when I was in high school, I know I really enjoyed the process of making things and I knew I liked learning different software that would help me do so, but I wasn't entirely sure what that might look like as a job, whether I wanted to do something similar to my parents in architecture or a career in advertising. I think at that stage it can be really hard to picture what that looks like in the real world. Um, so something unpredictable that sort of really helped ease that uncertainty and inform that decision was when Eamon Donnelly came to our VizCom class for a day. So Eamon's an accomplished freelance illustrator who does these really incredible colourful portraits of musicians and celebrities. He's done a lot of work for Rolling Stone, he has published books and his work's really inspired by his sort of personal nostalgia for 1980s Australia. Um, so for me, I guess being exposed to this really expresses sort of graphic artwork and meeting the person behind it was crucial to shifting my understanding of what was possible in career in graphic design. It hadn't really occurred to me at this stage that you could get away with this sort of thing or that it might have been an option. <laughs> I came away from that class feeling really inspired 
and straight away looked into what's involved in learning to produce this sort of work. So I sort of started to combine my like existing software skills with Photoshop and Illustrator with what I understood about design and how to be creative, which is absolutely something I'm still learning. And I started to produce these kind of like digital illustration work. So I'll just flip through a few examples of what I produced. Um, so a lot of portraits of musicians, a lot of gig posters, adopting this super heavy kind of ironwork style and how I can kind of apply type and make it feel like it was printed. So this was a screen printed poster, which um, I had a lot of fun learning how to do and was a really good way to start learning how to apply, I guess, you know, fun sort of artwork stuff that I was just doing in my free time to real mediums. Um, I got to print stickers for Record Store Day, which is a heap of fun. So this got sent out to a bunch of vinyl stores in Australia. Um, and they were sort of handed out just to people buying albums on Record Store Day. Um, and I, f I find this work really sort of rewarding um, and really enjoy it. So, oh, whoops, I might go back. <laughs> this folio <laughs> of uh, music-related illustrative work led me into practices outside of illustration. So I'm now getting to apply these sort of skills um, to different practices like branding and animation and web design and sort of really define the way I sort of approach design and um, creativity. And it's really pointed me in the right direction in understanding what I enjoy in a job. So I guess to tie this all into the theme of unpredictable, I'm still learning and very much in my early days of my career, but I think it's really important to keep myself open to letting my personal interests inform things like career aspirations at this stage. Allowing room for a sort of an element of unpredictability can be a really good thing. And I think it's really important to incorporate your personal interests and experiences to something like design, because that's what people tend to relate to when they interact with it. So yeah, thank you. Nick, thank you so much for sharing so honestly uh, about your journey. It's fantastic. Um, our final presenter for this portion of the evening uh, is William Ritchie. So William graduated from Geelong College in 1997. And he became a molecular biologist, interestingly, uh, who now also works as an artist, constructing highly realistic paintings, drawings and sculpture. He sees realism as the ultimate test of skill and expression of understanding, a way of incorporating science into art, where he portrays subjects in such a way as to invite others to learn about them and to appreciate them better. William now lives in Victoria's Macedon Ranges, a great spot for art and science, I dare say, uh, and primarily paints landscapes and wildlife mostly working in oils, but also in gouache, watercolour and graphite. Please welcome William. All right. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, my name's William Ritchie, obviously. Uh, I finished in 1997, a long, long time ago. And uh, I think, much to the dismay of my parents and teachers, I spent most of my time looking out the window and drawing birds. <laughs> so when I, when I left school, it was, uh, there's no money in that, there's no future in that, you've got to go and get a job or do a degree. So uh, I went and did a degree. I wasn't much of a student, so that's where I started. Oh, sorry, I went and got a job. So I did that for a few years, and then uh, I decided there wasn't much of a future in what I was doing there. I'd better go and do something else. So I did a Diploma of Natural Resource Management. Uh, I enjoyed it, and I did OK. And then I moved through to a Bachelor of Animal and Veterinary Bioscience. I enjoyed it, and I did OK. So I did an honours year. <laughs> and uh, I enjoyed that, and I did OK. That was in zoology. That qualified me for uh, an opportunity to do a PhD. Uh, I don't know why I did, but I did. Uh, and for some reason, I changed disciplines into molecular science. So there's your unpredictability already. Uh, and that was, to put that into perspective, what is molecular science? It was uh, immunology and genetics in the field of parasitology. So there's a few ologies in there for you. And then after working as a research science for a little while, I decided there's not a lot of money here. It's very, very demanding. Job security is appalling. Uh, and I'll probably have to chase it overseas, which I didn't want to do. So I started looking out the window and drawing birds again. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And sometimes the birds kindly, well, not kindly, but sometimes they fly into the window and it makes the drawing process just a little bit easier. <laughs> I, it, it makes my life easier. It shortens theirs, and I do thank them for their sacrifice. And you can see a couple of them down the bottom. So where did it all start for me? Well, it started when I was probably seven and a half. So the echidna on the left is uh, one I drew when I was seven and a half. And my mum packed me up and took me in to see a local artist called Robert Ullman. And he straightened me out and said, you need these materials and this is what you need to do. So that's where my artistic journey really kicked off. And then when Robert passed away, uh, an ornithologist and renowned bird life artist by the name of Richard Weatherly took me under his wing, pardon the pun, and uh, away I went. So the next step is probably this painting on the right, which was, is the Isarava War Memorial on the Kokoda track. So I walked that in 2007 and I produced that from photos and a few sketches whilst on the track. Uh, and that kind of gave me the confidence that maybe, maybe I can do this so, uh, as a, in a more professional way. And that's what I do today. So uh, this is some of my work. Uh, I'm always trying to find something that appealed to me in what I look at. I spend a lot of time outdoors, looking around, taking photos, drawing pictures. Uh, my favourite pastime is still that quick sketching from life. But uh, I do less and less of it as time goes on with kids and everything else. Uh, I'm as much a student of art as I am of science, uh, even though I've racked up a few credentials in the science side, I haven't got any on art, but I've been a student of the game for a long time now. Uh, I'm always looking for a way of doing something, a way of executing something, uh, a new technique uh, or methodology or approach, and you can borrow them from anywhere. I'm certainly one that believes that if you're going to be critical of someone else who does something, you probably should be able to do it yourself. So uh, I know that abstract and all these other sorts of artwork get a bit of stick, so I thought, well, I'm not one to be critical of it, but if I am going to be, I better be able to do it. So I tried, but then this duck swam into the middle of it and <laughs> kind of ruined it. <laughs> so sometimes it's about, uh, it might be something simple, it might be just colour. So blue and pink, an interesting combination. And if you're going to draw a bird on a stick, well, make it interesting. So, and make the stick interesting as well. And in this one, it's all a little bit about the shadow, putting a subject matter that's not even in the picture but has a bearing on both things in there, just as a, a point of difference and something of interest, an implied detail. Uh, if, as a dad, you, you probably like your dad jokes. Uh, I certainly do. The old polar bear in a snowstorm when you hand someone a white page. Uh, well, here's a black bird on a black background. And I, think I, I think I didn't get the joke. But uh, sometimes it's about atmosphere. There's always something that you want to achieve. So uh, in this one, it was all about atmosphere. How do you paint a, a black bull without using much black at all? Um, oh, hang on, here we go. Sometimes it's about uh, something you've seen. So in this case, a predator revealing itself. And that predator-like stare was something I really wanted to capture there, as well as the motion and the, the depth of field. So there's always something you're trying to achieve, no matter what you do. I don't just paint animals. Uh, I think at the start we mentioned landscapes as well. That one there is about a bit over a metre and a half across. Uh, it's Cavendish in Western Victoria, looking back at the Victoria Range of the Grampians. Uh, there's an enormous amount of wildlife action in that, believe it or not. Uh, and lots of little details, but the painting's so big you can't really see them. But the idea is uh, I'm very much against just painting a landscape. Uh, there's so much moving and things happening in there that people often omit. So I try and put them in where I can, beyond the sheep. So uh, my journey to date, I've managed to kick a few goals, I suppose, if you can do that in art. So the Society of Animal Artists is uh, an international society. Um, it has a very high uh, knockback rate for applicants. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get in on my first attempt. Um, and I've exhibited with them overseas in America. So that was a, a great honour and uh, something I'm, I'm looking forward to what happens next. The other one that's uh, a good accomplishment, I suppose, is the Artists for Conservation, again, a juried group, and uh, one I'm quite proud of. Uh, I've also been very fortunate to be a finalist uh, three times in the Holmes Art Prize for Realistic Bird Life Art. Uh, it's the only one of its kind in the country, so it's, uh, it's a pretty good get to get in, and uh, I got a highly commended with that swan, which is uh, one below the winner. So, Pipped at the post, but not too disappointed. 
And uh, the only other accolade that's not on there, which is in the works, is uh, Feathers and Brush, Three Centuries of Australian Bird Life Art uh, by Syro and Penny Olsen. Uh, they're releasing the sequel to that, and I got notified that I got a Guernsey. So very chuffed with that one. Uh, if you're looking for my, me and my work, uh, that's my website. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, so you can find me there. And uh, to finish up, I suppose the unpredictable nature of it all. Um, who knows? There might be a little bit of money in art. Perhaps in two, three hundred years, I'll make a good living out of it. <laughs> so thank you very much. William, thank you so much. Uh, in a strange turn of events, I actually came across your work online a couple of years ago uh, and uh, didn't realise you were a Geelong uh, old collegian. And of course, when um, Kevin Jess suggested you as someone to come, I thought, I know that name. I can't quite figure out where I know that name. And then I realised that I actually have one of your pictures that I printed off the internet because I didn't know how to buy a whole painting that time. So uh, I have that uh, actually on a wall of mine at home. So I'm now going to uh, start trying to get myself an actual painting of yours. That will be fantastic. Uh, well, look, um, I hope you've enjoyed the variety of experiences and passions of these three speakers this evening. Um, please join me once again in thanking our three speakers. So it's going to take us about two minutes now just to transition to the setup for our panel. Uh, if you uh, would like to, you feel free to stand and stretch your legs. Um, uh, it only takes us a couple of minutes, don't wander too far, and we'll be back in about two minutes. All right, well, thank you for your patience. Um, we're now ready for the next part of the evening. So the panel are going to be discussing how they become able and adapt to anything unpredictable that the world may throw at them as designers. We are honoured uh, to have a special panel chair of the highest calibre with us this evening too. Uh, she is going to introduce this portion of the evening more properly uh, and including introducing our panellists in a moment. But I would just like to take a minute to introduce uh, her to you. Uh, Tuva Kocaturk is a Professor of Integral Design at Deakin University's School of Architecture and Built Environment. She's the founding director of the MIND Lab. MIND stands for Mediated Intelligence in Design. Uh, it's a transdisciplinary and practice-based research group uh, that operates at the intersection of the built environment, information technology, and design innovation. She's also co-leading the Design Mind, uh, that is Deakin University's international design and innovation platform. Her expertise centres upon the creative, generative and collaborative use of information and communication technologies and digital media in built environment and in design. Please welcome Tuba Kocaturk. Is it working? Yes. Thank you very much, Emily. That was a great introduction. And, you know, sitting on this throne... You know, <laughs> There's a bit of, you know, ego caressing here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting. Um, you know, when Emily um, contacted me for this event, you know, I, I thought I couldn't miss in a million years to talk about design anytime and anywhere. So it's a great pleasure to, to be a part of this. Um, so um, welcome to the Geelong Design Week um, organized by um, uh, Geelong College, the Young Masters Unpredictable. Um, so, um, I'm, I'm first going to um, talk a little bit uh, as an intro to the conversation that I'm going to have with the panelists. Um, so, a little bit of intro and I'm going to introduce the panelists and then we're going to have, hopefully, a great conversation. Um, so, I've been reflecting on, you know, how, how to approach the concept of unpredictable uh, with these wonderful designers. So uh, I'll share with you a little bit of my thinking, what went through my mind, um, eventually ended up you know, coming up with the questions that I will be asking to the panelists. So um, the coronavirus pandemic has changed many things. Its impact on global well-being 
and the economy has forced organizations in every industry to change, adopt and evolve, both in real time and in the long term. Indian writer Arundhati Roy wrote the following lines in an article for the Financial Times last year, where she talks about the pandemics as portals. She says, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break the, with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. The question is what we would like to do next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the prejudice and hatred, or we can walk through lightly, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So these are her words. I believe designers have a great role in future changes on the other side of the portal. Not only because as designers, we have the knowledge and the skills to deal with unpredictability and complexity, but also because we have the tools and the ability to create. There's a wonderful quote that is attributed to Ellen Kay. He eloquently put it this way. He said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Through design, designers have incredible power to inspire and make change happen. They can make a product last. They can influence behavioral change, establish new business ideas. They can combat what is desirable from a human point of view with what is technologically feasible and economically viable. I have great pleasure to uh, introduce four brilliant creators and designers this evening to have a conversation about design thinking and to demystify, and I, I haven't chosen that word lightly, we're going to demystify what is in a designer's toolkit for tackling complex problems, unlock creativity and become agents of change in their respective roles. Before I introduce the propositions for the discussion, I would like to introduce our designers. Um, firstly, David Gilbert Kent. I'm here. David graduated from the Geelong College in 2002 and is now the founder and director of Geelong-based creative agency. Three names created. Having worked in the design industry for over 15 years in various creative agencies in Melbourne, David started his own business in 2017, specializing in three main areas, brand, design, and digital. David loves the diversity of his work, be it designing a new brand for a startup construction company, building a website for a law firm, or creating a large-scale e-commerce platform for baby products. It keeps things interesting, he says. David always knew exactly what he wanted to do post-school, and it was from there he was able to pave the way for his future in the design industry. Welcome, David. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and we have Fern, Fern Millen. Hello. Fern graduated from Geelong College in 1996 and is a multidisciplinary creative artist whose main focus is on storytelling through photography and installation. From a young age, her love of culture and the land was nurtured by her parents, who took her and her siblings to many national parks to enjoy the natural world. Fern was first mentored in photography by the late Peter van der Veer, it helps having lived in the Netherlands to do those pronunciations. <laughs> While she attended the Geelong College. In 1996, she won the VCE Art Prize. Fern then went to the Victorian College of Arts, where she majored in photography and theater studies. Fern's love of performance saw her focus on photographing live music and theater. Her vision for his photographic journey is to continue to develop it into a library of images and sound bites that are accessible to a wide, wider audience before these images and their related stories are fragmented and lost. Welcome, Fern. Thank you for having me. Thank you. 
And we have Casey Egan. G'day. Casey graduated from Geelong College in 2004, and he's now Global Men's Head of Design at Rip Curl. He attended Shillington College in Sydney to further his interest in graphic, graphic design before finding himself working at Quicksilver in the art department. After four years at Quicksilver and working in the industry, he was hired by Levi Strauss and Co. as the global progressive denim designer based in San Francisco, California. Working at Levi's is where his passion for apparel design really began and found himself really drawn to the idea of designing through the medium of fit fabric trims and washes to create new products. Since Levi's, he has held roles as head of design for Wrangler, set up his own denim brand, DIG, and more recently, working as global head of design for Rip Curl. Some of the benefits of working for a core surf brand, besides surfing daily, is he can continue to further his passion for design on a global scale and collaborate with extremely talented artists, innovative fabric mills, and help world-class athletes to create exciting new products for the consumer. Welcome. Last but not least, we have Kate Fitzpatrick, a fellow Hi. architect. Sorry, hello. <laughs> Kate graduated from the Geelong College in 1998 and is now a registered architect and director of Our House Architecture Studio. Kate grew up in Bushy Eltham with hippie parents who built their own mud brick house. Alistair Knox, a pioneer of modern mud brick design, was a close family friend, and her formative childhood years spent exploring building sites and playing in the wild natural environment were instrumental in guiding her future direction into architecture. At Geelong College, the House of Guilds was a source of respite with the hectic school week. Tucked at the bottom of the oval, away from the main campus, the HOG fostered an environment of camaraderie and artistic freedom. On leaving school, Kate completed her architectural degree at the University of Melbourne while working for Neil and Idle Architecture, led by another old collegian, Chris Idle, a small-scale practice whose thoughtful house designs cemented her ongoing focus on single housing. After a stint in London, she started Our House Architecture with Ben Stibberg. The practice has been operating for 10 years and works predominantly on the Surf Coast and Bellarine Peninsula, designing houses that respond to and sit gracefully in the environment. Welcome. So I've got three statements I'd like to share with you, and I would like to ask in, you know, any, not in any particular order, to respond and share your experiences. So I'll first introduce the three uh, themes that I'd like to talk about with you. One is, uh, the first one is designers as connectives. Then design as a human-centered approach to problem solving. And the role of imagination and communication in design. So I'd like to start with designers as connect connectors. And actually, before my question, I would like to make the statement about, um, you know, when, when we, when, when you know, anyone, people think about designers, the main focus is on the output, the product. We hardly ever talk about the process. I think one of the powers of designer is the ability to connect new, different knowledge sources. And the question is actually, what other disciplines, sectors, and stakeholders do you interact in your work? And how do you integrate all those ideas and insights and inputs to reframe new value? Does this bring some sort of predictability or create more unpredictability for you and for your work? 
Who would like to start? Testing, testing. Can I be a singer now? Can I jump out of my drawer? I'm just thinking about, I have a yellow sticky tab on my fridge that says designing change. Design change. I'm not a designer. I don't see myself as a designer. I'm a photographer, but I'm a, so, I'm, I'm a social voice. That, and so I've been working with the Aboriginal people, the Wadarong elders locally, to construct and design a process of allowing people to be heard, their stories, the stolen generations. And these are our people, the Wadarong, the place that we stand and sit on today. Um, for, I think the process of um, designing that change can be very difficult to do on your own. In fact, you can suffer a bit of lateral violence. You can see that happens within that space. It's a very difficult area to work in. But you can accommodate that by allowing others to work with you and engaging other people to collaborate. And I think the best thing that came out of COVID was reaching out to know that I couldn't do this alone. But ironically, being alone at home, thinking I need to collaborate, was the first year that it happened. So that's probably the summary of how I recognised that you needed to collaborate in a time when you couldn't be alone to recognise or realise the vision you had for a project. You actually had to engage with other people like Regional Arts Victoria. I had to learn how to write grants, City of Melbourne provided a grant to me and um, is this sort of thinking, how you're thinking about this process? Um, and I had to engage a, a sound artist who I'd worked with before to record the stories of these Wadarong elders. Um, but I also had to consult thoroughly with the Wadarong office and a lot of the time on Zoom, but just to navigate what I could do that was, you know, culturally, the protocols were culturally respected and understood. So, I suddenly reinvented myself as a, an art director during COVID because I had to accommodate all these people to navigate into this space so that it was completely unpredictably predictable. <laughs> Shall we continue with you, David? Um, I'd probably like to use a case study, I suppose, as a, um, as an example of um, predictability and unpredictability. Um, so a client of mine um, named Rock Sugar, they're a, a Thai, um, Thai restaurant in Melbourne, um, South Yarra. Um, pretty cool, trendy sort of joint. Um, obviously got hit the six with, um, with COVID and um, they came to me um, in a little bit of you know, disarray and panic saying, um, our doors are closed. Um, what can we do to, um, to make money? And... Um, so they had a really, they had a pretty good web website, um, but uh, I came up with the idea of, well, how about we pimp the website up and, uh, and introduce a shopping cart so we can actually sell product online. Um, so because it was, because it's a bit of a, an iconic sort of restaurant around those parts, um, we got some merch together, photographed that. Um, we introduced some electronic vouchers um, and obviously um, takeaway and pickup menus. Um, but it was good because it was a, um, it was a way that they could um, sell stuff and, um, and keep the business going, keep the doors up. The doors were closed, but keep the business going. Um, so, um, yeah, look, obviously that, that's riddled in um, all sorts of issues with unpredictability. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it was a good result for them. They, um, they were able to keep going and um, yeah. But all of those input that comes from clients, from those other you know, people involved. So you have to kind of choreograph all of that input into the output. Yeah, yeah, so um, I might get you to repeat that one, sorry. <laughs> so what, what, what I mean is, so there's so much information coming from, you know, and requirements and desires. Yeah. And p part of the, I think, beauty of the process of design is bringing all of those different inputs together to create something meaningful out of it. And sometimes those inputs are mutually exclusive. Yeah. So there needs to be a lot of coordination and decision making. Sometimes you upset people. And yeah. so how, 
how, how, how do you reflect on that process of collaboration and coordination? Yeah, I think um, I had a pretty good um, relationship with the client um, and um, it's sort of, yeah, I'll look, I might hand pass that one, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, try yeah, these rules, sorry. I, I think, Kate, what you do with clients sometimes can be painful. <laughs> yes, look, I mean, coming from a, from a, um, a residential architecture perspective, you know, people, I'm building family homes for people. This is a huge oh. outlay of money for them. It's, you know, often um, the biggest outlay that they'll make really in their life, depending who it's for. And there's so many stakeholders involved. Um, even usually within the client group themselves. So even just with houses, having, you know, you often feel like a bit of a psychologist sitting at the table. You've got a husband and wife together. <laughs> You're trying to read the play a little bit as to who, you know, who you need to be catering to. You need to be listening to both parties and then trying to find common ground. Obviously, they're both wanting a project, but, you know, they might have quite competing, competing desires and different ideas about where they want to spend their money. So, yeah, you have to – I definitely feel like I've become um, quite adept when it comes to human psychology, actually. It's not something that's included in the degree, but I think it would be useful. Um, but then there's other stakeholders such as council, you know, obviously with built environment, everybody is very interested in what's going on around them. If you're trying to build a new house, all your neighbours are going to arc up, you know, they don't want to see change, and I can understand that. So – trying to do designs that will please everybody, but at the same time trying to break the boundaries and do something new at the same time is really quite tricky. Um, so, yeah, I do feel like we have a very conciliatory role, trying to bring everybody on board, um, you know, trying to get everybody excited about the project, even though they've got their own... Um, Oh, well, they're coming at it from different angles and at a different angle from our clients as well. So, yeah, it's a really interesting job from that perspective and so much of the job is about problem solving. So most people look at it and they think, you know, they see the pretty picture and they think, oh, you know, that's what architecture is about. It's just about designing these beautiful houses. The, you know, the sketch design stage of the project is about 10%. It's about 10% of the work and after that it's all about bringing everyone together to actually make this thing happen. Thank you. Um, yeah, for us um, in product design, I guess everything that uh, we create is for a consumer need. So a lot of the time uh, we just have this complete fake customer that we make up in our head, unlike a real husband and wife or house of you, and it's real money for us. It's, uh, we would name a fake person in our mind and really design the end need for them. Um, I think a lot of the collaboration that we find in uh, working in a bigger team, designing product or clothing side of things. Uh, we kind of get stuck in our way on this train track of um, same, same, and we sort of have our skill sets and we kind of run through it, whether it's a graphic artist or a product designer or a fitter or um, a fabric technician. But a lot of our innovation or breakthrough will come through from people that probably say that they have no design skill whatsoever. Uh, and they're the ones that actually have a need in the field that they want. So whether it's uh, creating a board short or something for a big wave surfer and they realise that what they need is kind of life or death and you kind of work out that they are the most experienced possible in that field to design a product for them um, where we aren't putting ourselves in that situation. We kind of feel like we know best because we are designers and we're good at drawing things and building a product and... The end result is that uh, we need to collaborate with crew way outside of our comfort who probably have no experience in design. They probably end up being some of the best designers and they're shocked by it. So uh, for us, it's kind of, you find it, the unpredictability is you don't know who your collaborator is going to be throughout the process until the end result. And then um, I think some people even shock themselves uh, with the output, which is cool. Thank you, Casey. Well, that's, that's a good, actually, point um, to jump into the next topic. It's about how you deal with the user or the people and to create the experience or the product or the interaction, whatever the design that you're dealing with. So how do you deal with the human or the user, um, whoever would like to start? 
I'll uh, continue with you if for... you want. <laughs> I was touching on it. But... He's key. Uh, well, the, the thing I was kind of, I guess, saying before then was um, we don't know, like, a lot of the time who the end user is, unlike some fields, and it makes it really hard to kind of create product that you don't even know what um, if the person's going to like it or not, so it's a real leap of faith. But I think there's kind of, like, easy design principles to bucket it into to work out whether or not it's um, kind of the right area. And it's kind of like either innovation or sustainability or um, even just kind of recruiting the next generation of kids to enjoy it or like the aesthetical purpose of it, uh, which is purely just fashion, like how that is and trying to kind of build those together to work out the end product. So no matter what, even if you don't know what the end result is, if you kind of put these sort of guidelines or pillars for yourself, um, you kind of have a way of going forward and creating a product or design into a need, even if you don't know what that Can I ask is. something though? When you have a new product idea and you know you prototyped it and before you actually you know put it into the world, I'm assuming you would test it with you know potential users, different demographics and etc. How, how, how do you do, um, deal with that? A lot of like innovative product, like whether it's um, like rainwear or um, like garments for elements or to work to work in the element is like a long process. So um, to get to a certain thing, there's like incremental little growth in like a board shirt or a jacket or a wetsuit or whatnot or jeans, but um, it's like a two to three year process and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it looks minor and probably no one actually cares, but deep down you've put a lot of like time into it and sometimes you get to travel and test it yourself or unfortunately send it to people just to test it themselves. But um, the end result is, uh, where you're trying to get to, you don't know if it's going to function, and you got to really put your time into it because, just like building, like getting a house or something, you've got to make sure it works at the end result. And your skill set will work that out over time, but that's that problem solving side of design, mm -hmm. whether it's for a client or for anything, you um, can't just rush it. Like, it sounds like it kind of take that time, but you can't rush that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I think. Um Prototyping is a really important tool. Um, in in my game, I do a lot of digital design, so websites and EDM campaigns and social stuff. Um, but prototyping is one of those things where, you know, um, particularly with a website, for example, you've got your desktop version and then you've got your mobile version. Um, and I run a small business, so it's... You know, a lot of clients like to see how that, how that looks, how that feels, how that functions. Um, and, you know, my, my process is I, um, I start with the, the creative, um, and that might just be flat PDFs, um, but they often want to see how it interacts with the user. So, you know, you then build a prototype. It might only be a home page or landing page or something like that, but at least they get to see how it looks on a mobile phone, which is completely different than what it looks like on a big desktop computer. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it's quite important. Thank you, David. I'd like to ask you, Fern, sure, because you, you, you're, how, how do you, um, when you're creating photography, obviously, especially when there are humans involved in it, they're, you know, there may not be necessarily either. But um, I, I don't know exactly the, the business. Do you also get commissions and somebody you know, tells you a specific requirement and then you have to negotiate what is required and with your own art and artistic expression? How, how do you reconcile that? Mm, I wasn't expecting that question. <laughs> I'm just feeling into... Uh, I. I am a storyteller for the clientele and I'm also a storyteller of my own voice, my own voice as an artist. Last year there was a shift, I sort of lost 90% of my work and it made me focus on the artist's voice and so that was really pleasing to me and I suddenly had a shift in where I want to go in my career. However, this week coming up I'm working for CCMA which is a water board authority for this region and I have other... Um, sort of other events coming up again and I'm back into that commercial space but what's really pleasing is that I'm seen as the, the, a lot of the, even CCMA came to my exhibition which just finished at the Geelong Art Centre 
and it was called Journey on Water on Country. And it came, it came as, at the beginning it was called Treaty on Water on Country and I had to step back because of, I was a, you know, kind of privileged white woman. I had to learn my place and understand before I put it all out there. Um, and so the, it became Journey on Water on Country and it was quite pleasing to see that commercial clients came to my exhibition and they saw what I could do for them. So now the CCMA want me to interview a lot of the um, Estuary Watch and, and Water Watch people that are volunteering throughout Victoria and photograph them to, to do another series of a way of communicating. So it's kind of the perfect marriage of my creativity being seen for what potential I have to give back to the community, in a sense, and also them filling a gap that they need to do in their own work, and that is really important for them to be going in the right direction with their water works and also acknowledging the water on people and acknowledging a lot of their people were, were, were um, you know, they were sort of um, laid to rest alongside riverbeds. So there's a lot of, it's interesting to see that correlation with things and, and often it's just about listening very deeply to each client, each person that you're photographing and constructing an image that is, I don't, I, sometimes I, I don't know what I'm going to get, you know. It's about really feeling into that space, listening deeply and and being open to what, what they want to share and it can be different on different days. And, and, and the beauty and the magic happens when, you know, they come back to that space or they see the photography and they didn't expect what they were going to get and it's better and more impressive than they were after. And that's always a completely rock star moment for you. You know, you're like, oh, that's what you want. And it doesn't have – and it can be, um, you know, a, a small sort of client down in the Otways that is doing like an, an outdoor-based um, environmental project or it can be a larger, you know, corporation. And, and I've worked with so many different ones. Like I did the Porsche McCann launch along the Great Ocean Road, jumping in and out of cars. So my work is so diverse and it still always comes back to – pleasing that client and having a vision for them and recognising that their vision, they're trusting you with their vision, they're trusting you to see something more. So you've got to deliver something a bit more, you know, and I always kind of strive to be that, just that little bit better than what they expect from me. No pressure. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Ruth. And I'll come back to you, you know, as an architect. I mean, you, you are at the moment, um, primarily designing re residential, but obviously you're an architect, so um, I, uh, you, you design other types of um, buildings as well. So I would like you to reflect a little bit the difference. You know, again, we're still talking about the human-centeredness. How does it differ when you're designing a residential house or when you're designing an airport, for example? How, how does your perspective about the user changes? Oh, yes, look, I mean, I think it's an entirely different it's an entirely different thing. So with residential architecture, um, oh, look, to be honest, I don't have a huge amount of experience outside of that other than in commercial architecture. Commercial architecture has a different set of parameters and, in fact, all of the different, you know, typologies do. So, you know, if you're designing a civic space, then you just have to think so much more broadly. And I would love to design a civic building, you know, having to think about how the city is actually going to use this space, how you, you're bringing a design into the city that's actually going to be um, a, probably a communal space for people, how you're going to um, bring people in. I, I was always very interested watching Federation Square. You know, there was so much negative media about that when that first started up, and there often is when it comes to new commercial buildings. But then, you know, as it came together, you could see that it was really creating the most amazing gathering space for people. And, I don't think anybody realised that it would become a space where everyone would gather together to watch the grand final of this, you know, the soccer when Australia, oh, well, they didn't make the grand final, the semis or something like that. But it was this huge collection of people, amazing. But then, you know, when you get down to residential architecture, it's much, much more personal. It's just this one-on-one, -on -one really, with the client. And, you know, as I said before, they're putting so much money into it and it really is, you know, something that's a, a dream project for them. But one of the main things we find is sort of tempering expectations. So 
there's just so much um, social media, just imagery, just flying out at everybody every day. Um, and so, you know, clients are always coming back and saying, oh, you know, could we do something like this? Could we do something like this? You're like, just got to put all of that aside. This has to be something that's about you. It's about your site. It's about how you connect with your environment around you and your context. And, you, you know, you've got to sort of pair it back to the essentials rather than being just too, you know, getting distracted by all the flashiness that's around us these days. Thank you. Um, the, ne the next, um, let's say, topic of discussion is about, so no matter what we design um, in whichever sector, we start with an idea, you know, this creative spark, and then slowly we start shaping it a little bit, we sketch, and then we detail it a little bit, and then we go back again, and then slowly we follow a process through which we make things a bit more concrete. So I would just like you to reflect on that process. You know, how, how do ideas, the creative spark, um, they translate into the actual you know, outputs and your reflection as a designer in that process? Um, I usually tell my boss that I have to go to like Tokyo or, <laughs> or London and it's impossible to achieve unless I stop off in Hawaii on the way back. So that's kind of like, uh, when it comes to product design, it really comes with um, kind of grouping together the crew that you're going to work with and uh, sort of just starting that research and knowing kind of where you want to get to, but not exactly what that has to look like. Um, and then we'll kind of start to group that together and work out, uh, depending on what area you're working on, um, just how that can become. For us, it's not like an individual piece. It's usually a collection. So if you're putting together a range or... Um, you're going out with a season that you want to make it cohesive and tell a story through it. So that's our biggest point is to be able to uh, engage with the consumer kind of um, genuinely and be able to put together a story that um, they resonate with, whether it's tapping back into the heritage of your brand or um, I've always liked working with heritage brands like Levi's or Rip Curl or Wrangler with um, the fact that you can really draw upon their history. So. There's a billion one trends out there, especially in this day and age with social media, and you kind of can pick apart the one you want that feels right and find a way to bring that back to the brand. So um, for us, that's the most important thing. So if you're looking out there and everyone's on like 90s kind of music and these social trends are coming back, then you go, okay, what were we doing at that period? How can we reinterpret that in a modern way? And that sort of sets us off, and then it's the fun part of um, like crew do here when they're at school is like, find the fabric, move board it up, storyboard, find the color palette, like start massaging it and trying to create something new out of something old is probably the easiest alternative or um, default, not alternative, default to get back to uh, a good place to start. So that's the first half of the range and then it's just you kind of hope and pray that where you're going with the crew that you've got is in a good spot and then at the end the consumer will like it because you miss the mark as much as you probably hit it. But when you do, it's a really rewarding sort of um, space to be in. And when you sort of see a kid run down in an old polar fleece, it's bright yellow and it was the same one that the dad had in the early 90s or late 80s, you kind of go, okay, it's, we've pulled it off and it, the brand stays relevant. And a lot of our work is uh, in product is back to a brand or a collection or where you want to take your brand. Um, so that's kind of the process for us, I guess, in building product. Yeah, um, I like, one of my passions is working with startups. Um, so they'll come to me literally, um, sometimes not even with a name, um, not even with an ABN. Um, and it's just an idea. Um, but what I love doing and what I love being part of is that end-to-end -end process. Um, and so, you know, my, my process is I, I'll always meet with the client and... Um, and try to connect on that sort of um, that emotional level. It's, I find that's quite an integral part of the, the process because um, you get the best type of collaboration when you have a very good relationship, understanding your client, understanding your client's brand and its needs, but also where they want to take it and, and also where they've been um, to get to this point. Um, so, yeah, I quite, I quite enjoy that um, part of the, of the process. Ask you to 
draw that process, it, it wouldn't be like this, right? It's like you go there and then you go back and then at one point, you, at the end of the road, nothing is coming out, you have a conflict. So yeah. it's a bit of a messy process, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. But I think, um, and look, everyone's different, but I, I like to um, present three concepts. Um, two of them will be right on brief, um, exactly sort of what they're after, and then I'll always throw one in there that's a bit of a curveball. Um, and look, 90% of the time, they're probably not going to go with the curveball. Um, but um, it's good to have it in there because it gives a bit of balance. Um, it, it gets them thinking in another, in another way. Um, so, yeah, that's a... Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> Thanks. You've heard? Yeah, I'm thinking about um, two different various um, outcomes. But usually, I think, I think of the word vision... And having a vision is something that most artists kind of say, we have, we have one of those visions and something comes down and we have this idea. But it often, you often forget that that moment in time comes from, for me, 25 hard years of working as an artist. And, you know, sometimes finding it really difficult to make a living from it. And then sometimes having a great breakthrough and realising the vision that you had is the most rewarding thing. So in some ways, like, the wealth of my life is far outweighs the actual wealth that I can see in my pocket. But I do realise that something about realising a vision still for me is such... It just, it, it's just such a rewarding feeling and it just gives me... So last year, I'm in Janjak um, down the coast and I was stuck there with my little girl and I lost all of this work and I was thinking, what am I going to do? Oh, I don't have, you know, the, 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 I've got the mortgage coming, I've got all this stuff I've got to get paid. And, and I thought, oh, well, I know what I can do. I can go get, I can go do, every, do everything by the rule book, get the permissions from the Shire and get out on the road and photograph people isolating in their homes, in their businesses and capturing and documenting last year. And I am working with the head of um, art at Belmont High at the moment, it's putting t t together a, vis a virtual gallery of those images. Because, I mean, in that sense, that's kind of my job. I've got to document life as we see it. And, and quite often you have this great vision for the future of what you want, but you've actually got to come back and be really present. And really, really, when you're going out and talking to these people, it was, it was quite rewarding because I got to socialise in some ways. And sometimes they'd say, do you want to have a wine? <laughs> but sometimes they would sort of be very kind and, 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 you know, and be very open to it. And they said, oh, well, this is a chance for us to have a family photo. We don't usually get around to it. And um, so I, I just think the twists and turns are interesting with the final vision that you might have gets thwarted along the way. And it can be quite a beautiful outcome. And sometimes it, it's something it also emotionally rewarding for you because you feel um, there's something fulfilling in that and that you've been able to work through really difficult times and, you know, create a, a positive outcome for yourself, which is also, you know, is, is, a, is a great, um, as a role model, as a woman, to be there for my daughter to show her that I, I can do that. I can overcome ob you know, difficult obstacles. And no matter what um, career path you choose, you'll always find there'll be obstacles that you need to overcome, but what the benefits of those obstacles, if you get through them, you might actually come out on the other end with a, a stronger voice and a better vision for what you are as a person and who you are. And, um, and, and that creates your identity as an artist as well. Mm. Back to you. I remember a million years ago when I was a practicing architect before I jumped on to academia, I remember having some of those client meetings and I remember feeling so, <laughs> so angry, especially when you make progress in design and everything goes back to scratch and you know um, it, it's it's a long process the architecture and then there's the construction part of it and there are so many people involved in it how do you reflect on on that um, yeah no that's exactly right I mean if, you know doing a house some of our projects well they all take a minimum of three years really from start to finish and often out to five so it's a very long process um, look I have to say so. I put, we, we work in Melbourne and we work down the coast. Our Melbourne projects, getting them built, you know, the way that we've presented them in sketch design, 
is incredibly difficult because there's so many other people and that you have to go through before you can get to a building permit, the biggest one being council. Um, town plan and the town planning process is just so arduous. Um, and, you know, there's so many different stakeholders involved that and you happen to negotiate with all of them that you can come out with a product that is really quite different to what you started with. Um, but back before I worked in residential architecture, um, I did some commercial work and that was very difficult because, you know, you'd be promising so much at the start, but then because um, really the biggest, the biggest need when it comes to commercial projects is, you know, the bottom line and making money. And so, you know, they put out these artist's impressions, that's what we want it to look like, that by the time it gets through to the costing stage, everything is just getting stripped out of it. You're like, oh my gosh, this used to be a beautiful building. Don't look at it anymore. Just look at what I had on my website when back in render stage. But um, down the post, you know, we have a lot more freedom down here. The sites are much bigger, so you don't have to worry about your neighbours so much. And you also have the scope to do a lot more. You're, we find our clients are a bit more relaxed down here. Um, you know, they're all creating long-term family houses, so they're not so worried about the resale value, you get that kickback as well in Melbourne. You might have designed something and the clients are really on board and then they go and show five of their friends and they're like, what if you want to sell this in three years' time? Is that trendy enough? Is that going to meet the market? But um, down here, we do have a lot more freedom and we, we are amazed actually at how much we can bring our clients on board with ideas that are quite, quite different to what they initially came to us with. Thank you. Um, how are we doing in terms of time? Yeah, uh, so we're jumping on to the next question. It's the most fun question, actually. I hope you received this and you managed to think of your idol designer or artist or, you know, creator, whoever, uh, who influenced your work or who inspired you. Um, could be anyone. Shall we start with you? Yeah, um, mine is uh, Levi Strauss, who designed the blue jean in... 1853. So he's the uh, earliest of early designers and probably <laughs> the one thing that I, the reason I chose him was I basically uh, was fortunate enough to go and work for Levi's in the US and um, the one thing that I learned by going there is that there's this entire business built around one jean, one fit, one colour and it's the 501 blue jean um, and it's the most versatile designed garment in the world. Like it is uh, designed for miners in the 1800s. They still find uh, pairs of jeans down in abandoned mine holes in uh, Arizona from 1893, I think is the oldest pair and they're still in pristine condition. Um, so I have chosen that because it kind of like every 20 years, the single piece gets completely reinterpreted and um, reimagined by the consumer over and over again. So like in the 50s, it became the face of like the rockers and, the, and, um, and all that kind of like grease sort of style. And then in the 70s, it just went nuts but and became the main piece of like the hippie movement and the beat poet movement in San Fran throughout that era. Um, and then in the 80s, it went horrendous and they like acid washed it. And it just was cheap and nasty. And um, they became, you could get them for 30 bucks at a Walmart and, um, and then in the 90s, they became super cool with Kurt Cobain and the grunge era again. So, like, it's insane. And now uh, throughout the 2000s, it's all stretch and performance-based. So it's the most versatile piece of um, apparel ever. And um, they're still freaking cool. So, like, <laughs> in every generation, some kid's going to do something even better with it. Next time, you'll look at him and go, he's tripping, but it, they, they're out. So, um, yeah, the 1850s or something, but still work so they haven't changed so uh yeah that's kind of that's the one that changed everything for me on design product and i was doing graphics first and foremost but then that's when i started to love um the art of kind of creating garments and fit and fabric and washes and um yeah it sort of changed everything and i uh, even when i went to school here i had no interest in textiles whatsoever it was all used common photography and then um, when you leave, you kind of work out that there's more to it than just that in art. And, um, yeah, so that was me. It really inspired you, yeah, I can tell. All right. <laughs> Kate, yours? Oh, look, I'm not going to talk to one person in particular, but, you know, back in 
Yes, definitely back in my formative years. Um, I feel like growing up in Eltham and my parents building their own mud brick house and being a part of that, being a part of the process and also um, getting to go out on site with this other architect who we're friends with, um, Alistair Knox. Just the way that he um, viewed houses as, as an extension of the landscape or a representation of the landscape, really. You know, uh, very organic designs that are just really trying to get back to the essentials of what makes a beautiful space to live in. Um, and then, of course, all the great modernist architects which work to the same tenants. Um, you know, Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Alva Alto. Just the way that they conceive space is so beautiful and so timeless. And um, I just feel like, you know, coming back again to all the social media and just this bombardment of this imagery and, you know, everything is getting more expensive and buildings are getting so expensive to build. Gosh, it's just, you know, it's out of the range of a lot of people. It's, I, I can't even, you know, I feel embarrassed almost when I'm talking to my clients these days and telling them how much it's going to cost to build their houses. It's so much money. But anyway, the point is, you know, if that's the case, then it has to be something timeless. And so, you know, at the same time trying to break the boundaries, but then just realising what are the essential elements that are going to make a space beautiful to live in. And I think the bondlists, you know, they had that in space. Um, I don't really have a specific, um, like, favourite designer or genre or style or anything, but um, I think back to um, when I first got interested in design, it was probably at a wee, wee age where um, I was looking at, you know, dad's records, um, all these vinyl covers and stuff like that and noticing how the, um, how all the different type formations and image treatments and, you know, that's all pre, you know, computer stuff. Like, it's very impressive. And I'll often, um, you know, look back on those design principles and, and, and use them in, in, my, in my work these days. But um, I, I look at sort of design a little bit like... <laughs> A little like fashion, it's sort of like um, what I liked 10 years ago. Um, I, you know, I probably don't have that same sort of love for now. Um, it's a bit phasey. <laughs> Definitely appreciation for it, but um, yeah, I mean, like when I first started doing uni, I was like, everything was red, black, and white, punk rock, um, cut paste, slap it on, stencils, all that sort of stuff. Um, I'd like to think my style's refined a bit more over the, over the years. Um, but, um, you know, you, you're still sort of discovering new, new things um, and new styles. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, in the next 10 years, I'll, I'll have quite a large gamut of um, design genres I can, I can draw inspiration from. So, um, yeah, no real, no real specific, but, yeah, I definitely have a lot to... Um, uh, yeah, owe my dad for his vinyl collection, definitely. Mm. It's good to go last, because I was thinking how I haven't actually found that one influencer, which is probably more appropriate to say these days. Uh, however, I was always, um, you know, given the opportunity to question everything in the world, and one of the most influential things in my life was music, because I, not only did I study you know, saxophone and piano here, but I was a, a music photographer for most of my life and I've worked with some great artists in Australia. And I kind of feel, feel like something happened about five years ago. One of my photographs I took of Archie Roach, who's incredible, um, you know, Aboriginal artist and influential artist throughout the world, yeah. came to my studio in Janjak. And, um, and then a few years later, this PA for Ai Weiwei kind of, rings me and says, oh, can we use your photograph of Archie Roach? We want to make it into Lego. I went, yeah, that sounds great. So that was in the Ai Weiwei Warhol exhibition. And so Warhol is what is the key point here, is that he was, him and the artists in New York, were, like their lifestyle was more about, I wanted that. I wanted that to be my life. I wanted to be around other fantastic artists that question everything, that see the world a dif bit differently, but, but do good a lot of the time. And, and so 
I had also had this wonderful opportunity to go into the NGV after hours and I had to set up a copy stand set up, which wasn't easy to construct in a very short time. And I had to photograph the photo of Archie Roach made into Lego. I had to photo so that there's a photo of Archie of the Lego of my original photo, now the CD cover of one of his album covers. And for me, that's like, um, it's just an artistic kind of like coup, isn't it? It's pretty exciting to think some of those influences are now in your art. And it's, a, it's art that's mimicking art, as I think Greg was saying earlier, or, or Phil may have said that. So that the art, you know, mimicking art, it's like, pretty cool. I mean, doesn't it feel like we could just sit here and talk forever and then you could go and have a <laughs> tea or so? So, well, thank you very much for this delightful conversation and thank you for listening, thank you for joining. Um, can I please ask you to join me in thanking our panellists? All the panelists and speakers will be at the foyer if you would like to you know, speak with them individually while having your drinks. Thank you. Chuba, thank you so much um, for that fascinating conversation. I think uh, we could have probably sat listening to them all night, as Chuba has suggested. I'm sure you could have talked all night, all of you, and we would have loved listening to more of you. Uh, but it's given us a fantastic uh, insight, I think, into the work that each of you do, all in quite different industries um, and in working in quite different ways with other people. But I think uh, there's some really essential common ingredients to that process for all of you. And for me, reflecting on that, I think the human part of it is what I found most interesting. Um, I think just reflecting on the way in which design um, helps people to clarify their own identity a little bit uh, and a way in which you have to draw on the identity of the people you work with to create the work. I see that as a lovely little circle uh, and I, that's what I was reflecting on as I was watching and listening. So thank you so much um, for sharing so much of your lives with us um, over the last 45 minutes. Um, it does bring us to the end of the evening, uh, which I hope you have enjoyed. Uh, I would like to once again sincerely thank all of our presenters this evening who have kindly donated their time and their expertise and their passion for design. So can I uh, also just mention that some of them don't do this kind of speaking very often, and so for them it was quite new, uh, even a little nerve-wracking, but I'm sure you'd agree that they were all fantastic. And can I ask you to thank once again our three speakers and our four panellists and Tuba. Uh, and as a, a small uh, thank you gift for each of them, we have a, um, uh, a box, a gift box for each of you. Uh, it's full of some locally sourced treats uh, from a local business. Uh, a tuba for you. We also have an extra uh, small gift from the college, uh, something that was done by one of our students that we've framed for you uh, to keep. So thank you again. Uh, it's a token of our appreciation uh, for all of you uh, for your time and support for this event. I'd also just like to thank very quickly a couple of staff here at the Geelong College um, whose work in the technology and the design space has been instrumental to our success this evening. Many of them you've seen darting about as the evening went on. Uh, to Kevin Jess, uh, who is our Head of Design and Creative Arts. Uh, to Simon Benz, uh, our invaluable uh, art technician, uh, who's responsible for a lot of what you see here behind me. Uh, to Sam McIntosh, Chris Price and Joel Lay, who are our amazing uh, AV uh, technicians. They've been working very hard here this evening. Can I just ask you to join me in thanking those people? And lastly, thank you very much to you, our audience. Thank you for your engagement in the event, for your passion for design education and for the interesting work that designers do. Uh, we invite you to stay and mingle in the foyer with us, perhaps engage one of our speakers uh, in a conversation uh, or maybe network with some of the other attendees that are here. So on behalf of Geelong Design Week and the Geelong College, uh, thank you for being here and good night. <laughs>